In the current climate of video games, news outlets are often expected to publish reviews on the day of, if not before a game has even officially hit store shelves. This leads to critics often being rushed into their experience and ultimately failing to understand the full potential of a product. See, sometimes fully reviewing something means you really need to give it time. Games are kind of like food in this way. Once you can chow down on everything that's put in front of you and think to yourself, I like this, or this is disappointing, and never think of it again, Sometimes you have to stop and give yourself time to taste what you consume. Leave it on your tongue. Notice the details, the smell, the look, the consistency. I think it's unfair to give an arbitrary number to something you've only just said hello to. So let's spend, a, say, I don't know, a few years maybe, reviewing stuff instead. Let's talk about games, but let's make sure we get the full package here. Sound good to you? Alright, let's do this. The Witcher 3, easily enough understood as the third installment in the Witcher game series, came out on the 19th of May 2015. Despite already having two prior releases, the game became a massive success even amongst those who have never touched a franchise before and earned raving reviews for mostly everyone and everything. Based on the work of Andrzej Sapkowski, the game has in many people's opinions set a new bar for what role-playing games should aspire to be, with only a team of Polish developers and a small loan of $81 million. Compare that to something like Mass Effect Andromeda, which costs just over $100 million, and it's hard not to be impressed by the success of the project. The Witcher franchise is an RPG game series set in the fantasy world, in which the main character Geralt of Rivia lives as a monster hunter. These monster hunters, more commonly known as witchers, are human creations made to battle the hordes of creatures that live on the world known only as the continent. During an event known as the Conjunction of the Spheres, walls between dimensions were loosened and humans arrived alongside demons and beasts on this continent. However, as the need for mass extermination of monsters and protection lessened with time, so did people's respect for the witchers, and they are now viewed upon as freaks by the general populi. Some of the most powerful beings in the land are those who wield magic, and because Geralt is such a handsome chap, he meets and romances two sorceresses named Triss and Yennefer, of whom he can't really decide who he likes more. Oh, but he can't put his dingling in other chicks too. Let's get started, shall we? As previously mentioned, you play as Geralt of Rivia, and the title of the game also mentions the Wild Hunt. Prior to the events of this game, Geralt has already had a run-in with these wild cunts. At an earlier point, he actually rode alongside them, though not exactly of his own free will. He's obviously no longer with them, and the spectral riders now look for Geralt's sort of adopted daughter Cirilla, a child of the Elder Blood. Cirilla, or Ciri as she's more commonly known, is on the run and hops between worlds and places using her magic powers granted by her blood, and turns out to be as difficult to find no matter if it's our main character or the enemy looking for her. Geralt must therefore seek the help of his friends and allies across the land of Velen, Novigrad, and Skellige, picking up the crumbs left by his ward to try to save her. This all takes place within a political clusterfuck too, as Geralt first hears of Ciri's reappearance through a meeting with Emperor Amis the leader of the biggest empire in the world. Ciri is also the heir to the throne, coincidentally. To say they don't see eye to eye would be a huge understatement, they work together nonetheless to seek Ciri, although their intentions obviously differ with Geralt simply wanting to protect his loved ones like usual. The empire is at war with the northern armies of Redania, and on the brink of one with Skellige. Radovid, king of the armies of Redania, well, he's a sick fuck in many ways, really. And biased as that might sound, I'm not really talking about his political ambitions, but rather the fact that under his rule, the religion the Church of the Eternal Fire has come out to life, and now leads a quite literal witch hunt against all magic users, burning its users at the stake. Witchers like Geralt are safe at the moment, but as things progress, you might make decisions to change that stance. Speaking of decisions, my main reason for revisiting this game is exactly that, as this game carries a lot of them. Your actions in the story and side quests have the potential to crucially impact the game, 
and it offers you the chance to play and experience massively different outcomes from playthrough to playthrough. Many characters you meet will give you choices, but it's not as simple as yes or no, as sometimes what call you make can carry on into other scenarios later. I will speak about spoilers here, so I would recommend skipping to the next section now if that bothers you. Let's take Kira Metz as an example. You meet Kira and Velen, the glamorous sorceress stuck in the swampy land in an effort to flee the ever-watching eyes of the witch hunters in Novigrad. She helps you in your first fight against the Wild Hunt, but also asks for yours in searching a tower formerly owned by a scientist examining diseases. If you take the time to assist her, you'll be able to see this. Sorry about that, just wanted to share the trauma I saw of watching a Wraith kiss a man. Anyways, as the quest comes to an end, you realize she intends to use the research she acquired there to sway Radovid into giving her a place at his side, and here you are left with three choices. You can let her go to Radovid and ultimately doom herself to being brutally impaled and scorched on a pole. You can try to talk her out of it, and possibly forcing you to kill her as she refuses to stand down. Or, you can convince her to take refuge at the Old Witcher Castle Kaer Morhen, where you later in the story fight against the Wild Hunt yet again. During that sorta of late game skirmish, you might find yourself reaping the benefits of what you decided to do 20 hours in, when Kaera potentially saves your brother-in-arms Lambert's life. Geralt fights for those he loves, and to some extent that's quite literal. Keep your choices in mind. Now this is the part that carries the most discussion in this game. When I talk with friends, their reaction to the gameplay in The Witcher 3 is either that it's stale, sluggish, and weird, or that it's exciting, deep, and unique. I've been on both sides of the spectrum when it comes to the rating of this game. In terms of gameplay, the biggest aspects are of course combat, then with the added item and perk preparation systems. In my first playthrough of this game, keeping in mind I've now played through it four times, I really hated the combat. I thought it was annoying, I thought it was tedious. You basically jumped around like Batman in the Arkham games, and hit stuff in a standard way, and minutes of preparation before a boss fight just felt pointless when all the potion or oil gave you was 10% extra damage or a little bit of stat regeneration. Then I played this game with a controller. I actually first tried it that way at a friend's house on a PlayStation. Using the Urden spell and lighting up enemies felt completely different from everything I had done so far. It felt powerful, like my hits were well hitting, and all of a sudden it just suddenly felt so impactful. So I played it again, this time with a gamepad controller on the highest difficulty level Death March. And I fell in love realizing the fool I had been. Even after completing the story, I had still felt a grudge towards the gameplay. But now it hit me that you aren't some heavy knight in this game smashing axes and maces at other big dudes. Fighting is like a dance between you and your enemy both exchanging cuts and rolls until the opportune moment. It doesn't matter if you're fighting a puny bandit or some enormous monster. It's all an art, requiring respect for your enemy and the proper preparation. You then delve into alchemy and armor crafting, realizing your potential of becoming the greatest witcher to have ever lived. And you follow that instinct, seeking more and more powerful opponents, and sometimes you encounter something that even you can't defeat easily. But then you do defeat it, and you really feel like you just slaughtered something nobody else dared to. You are a Witcher. Oh, uh, and then there's Gwent. It's so easy to scuff this stuff away, but then you actually pick it up. And then you realize that the best part of this entire fucking game is collecting little playing cards and asking peasants to gamble away their valuables with you so you can become the Pokemon Master.
Yes, she's got a dragon. Looking at this game from purely the perspective of atmosphere, it's also incredible. You'll begin to recognize not only the landmarks around the world, but you'll also be able to tell where you are from the very grass you stand upon. Velen is a muddy shithole, even inhabitants there admit it. But as you are forced to follow a trail of sweets through a moist and damp swamp, you can almost begin to feel the uncomfortableness of the situation on your own skin. Wind whips in between the trees, revealing odors of rotting corpses from abandoned battlefields overrun by necrophages. Towns and inns are simply just there in the middle of nowhere, barely protected by either guardsmen or barriers. It's a hard, hard life, and it's taking its toll on the people who work in the wet and resort to the aid of witches and dark powers simply to get through the seasons. Novigrad and Oxford are homes for the elite for the most part, but even here you'll find slums and the watchful eyes of the Church of the Eternal Fire, which condemns as mercilessly as it kills. Bandits roam the streets, people peddle fish in the markets, or cover their heads in cloaks, hoping only to pass through the gates without being ransacked and abused. The Skellige Isles, though not entirely unique from one another, are surrounded by freezing cold water, snowy peaks, and the people to rival its toughness. Although the towns are perfectly hospitable, you can also understand why people there have such a respect of nature, with high waves and storms enough to kill any man or woman that dare step wildly on its shores. The soundtrack also carries weight on the story, not only clarifying where in the world you might be, but also highlighting the themes of each character you meet. Romance is touched with a small yet delicate harp. unsettle you with a twisted, almost possessed-sounding melody. Gontro Dim's theme follows the rhythm of a children's lullaby and draws out both a sense of mystery yet hopelessness. As if everything else wasn't enough, you also have access to a huge glossary, a book containing information about every single person and creature you encounter in your travels. Here you can read till your heart's content about Bart the Troll, or Geralt himself, whilst discovering that werewolves have a weakness to moon dust bombs. And although this is quite on the nose, I always get chills at how amazing this ballad sung by Priscilla explains Geralt and Yennefer's relationship. It 
took me time, but I'm glad I kept going back to The Witcher 3. I'm simply amazed by the video game miracle that is The Witcher 3. This game shouldn't even exist. It's so incredible to think it all started with a group of Polish dudes with no experience in video game production in 2008. CD Projekt Red have made one of the most memorable, graphically impressive, immersive, emotional, and exciting RPGs of all time, and it should without a doubt stake its claim as one of the very best games ever made. It even made me order a real book just to keep investing myself into it. Bravo CDR, bravo indeed. Thanks for watching this video. I uh, obviously left out the DLC in this review, uh, but I'd still love to talk more about them. So if you're interested in the follow-up, please share this video to a friend, and if enough people watch, I'll definitely consider doing one. This is a huge game, so there's definitely things I forgot or didn't have time to mention, but that's what the comments are for, so please tell me what you think below.